Testing. Test. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's really great to see everybody here. You plowed through the snow. Dig that. At least I did a little bit. At least it's not 30 below zero. So we got that going. So it's great to be here this morning, and I'm super glad that you guys are all here. I want to give you guys a few of our announcements and then get started. So first announcement. This afternoon, or I guess early this evening, 5.30, we meet for a good old-fashioned potluck. This week's theme is Italian. If you guys would like to sh join us for that, it's really awesome. It's mostly just fellowship. Uh, we, go over, we go over a little bit of the sermon at the end there. But uh, it's a great time, and it's awesome food. So please come, whether you have food or not. That's great. Hey, Wednesday nights is the youth group. FC Youth, that's at 6, six o'clock. Um, and then immediately following that, they do the, uh, the music. What do they call that? The Youth Initiative, Worship Initiative. That's on Wednesdays. Okay, and then on Thursdays, the Psalms Journaling Study. That's, that's Thursdays at 6 o'clock right here at the church. Uh, please don't miss that. And then some exciting stuff coming up February 16th. That's two days after uh, Valentine's Day, in case you guys are wondering that. We're going to have a men's coffee, 6 a.m. We'll meet right here. Um, last time, I think it was just uh, Roy and I. But uh, <laughs> if you, it was. It was great coffee, and uh, we didn't need you guys to show up anyway. So no. That's the 16th, so if you can make it to that, that would be awesome. The IF Gathering. That is uh, the IF Gathering 2024. That's for ladies. Um, that's coming up. It would be awesome. I'm told it is a great event. So please, uh, please consider that. And then also, if you are feeling uh, called by God to give today, we have several ways of doing that. There's a box by the door, and there's one in the back. And then there's also, you can do it by texting and or going to the, uh, the website there. Other than that, I would like to give a quick prayer for us this morning and then get started with our uh, worship music. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you on this, this awesome Sunday morning with the snow and the, the cold weather, but we can, uh, we can gather here as family, as your family, and uh, just enjoy each other's company and worship you. We're so blessed that we can do that. We ask that you would be here today with us and uh, enjoy us and just, just lift us up in your name. We ask this. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. God has brought each and every one of you. And I pray that you are um, heeding the call of the Lord. Sometimes it's really hard to understand what's his voice and maybe what's our own. But the fact that you're all here this morning, that's a good thing. Let's stand up and worship and let's praise him. Raise me a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. 
uh, who has found freedom in Christ? Well, I praise the Lord, right? We're in chains at one point in our life, and, and, and then there's another point where we're not, because that's freedom, and freedom in Christ, and God has saved our souls. So we're going to be singing this morning. It's a new song called Savior of the World. Um, it's fairly easy. It's not very fast, but it's, it's the message of the cross. It's the gospel message, and we're going to be singing about the Savior of the world, and have you heard?
Redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my fear rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. testimony up here right now, right? It's, God has been just working. I've seen it. I see it in my own personal life. I see it with my husband. I see it with friends, and I see it with people here in this church. 
God is freeing people. And I sat here and I watched <laughs> two of my brothers right here were looking at the Bibles they got because of their baptisms last Sunday. And they're looking at, this, at the certificates and they're looking at the Bibles. And I'm like, God, you have set them free. And I just, so good. God, you're so good. And we're going to sing now about how we're no longer slaves when we've been set free. the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to be Romans chapter 6, verse 15, Paul writes, What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to something as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one that you obey, 
either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you have enslaved righteousness. I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things that you are now ashamed of? The outcomes of those things is death. But now... Come on. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification. And the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, somebody. Who wants to be bound to sin and slavery forever and ever? Nobody. But we would much rather be slaves to righteousness, slaves to the Lord Jesus, because he has bought us with a price. And we're no longer enslaved to that thing anymore. But we used to be. We aren't anymore. Once you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are no longer bound to that slavery anymore. You are set free. You are bound to Christ from now and on forevermore. Church, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning that we can come here and worship you freely. Sing about how we've been set free. Sing about your great love. Sing about how we're no longer slaves anymore, God, to that sin problem that we used to have. But now we are yoked to you. We are slaves to you. We are servants of you, almighty God. And we are slaves to righteousness sake now. Paid for with a cost by our Lord Jesus. Thank you for that freedom. Thank you that we can worship together this morning in holiness and righteousness because of Jesus and in freedom. Lord, help us this morning to hear your word, to walk in those truths and apply it to our daily lives. Lord, we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Little kids, five and unders, you may be dismissed back to the children's ministry. Miss Samantha has some good stuff planned for you back there. There she is. Come on out, kiddos. Amen. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on, I feel you. I am so excited to be here, and I say it over and over, but I, there is no place I would rather be than in God's house with God's people, studying God's word, and singing God's praises. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be. It's a beautiful picture of his grace. And, um, man, we get to walk in that freedom, church. And... Um, we're no longer slaves to it. That's a beautiful, beautiful image of Christ and what he's done for us. So this morning, we're still in John chapter 14. And um, my goal today is to finish out John chapter 14. We may or we may not. <laughs> we'll see where God leads. But we're, the goal is that's where we're going to get to. That's where we're going to finish. And I just realized my iPad is not on top. There it is. I about psyched myself out there. Uh, so find your, if you've got a Bible, turn to John chapter 14. We're going to start in verse, four, uh, verse 15 this morning. So John 14, 15. And uh, we'll pick up where Daniel left off last week about Jesus has called us to do greater works, right? And we, Daniel hit on that very clearly that there is more for us to do than just say, I believe in Jesus, and then just sit and wait for him to come back. We've been given a calling, we've been given a task, we've been given a mission, and that is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, when we're finished receiving that from God, from Jesus, God in the flesh says, you've got greater works to do. In verse 15, he gives us further instruction. And now we've been seeing this week by week. This is leading up to the cross. This is still the same night as the Passover meal, as the washing of the feet. Judas went out. Jesus is still teaching. He is teaching all the way up to the point of the cross to his disciples because they're going to have to work and live in this world apart from Jesus, who they've been with for three years, day in and day out, teaching, learning, seeing, taking it all in. Jesus is prepping them for what it's going to look like without him, 
when he leaves to go back to the Father. And in verse 15, I love this. I had to stop after I read this one verse and just marinated on it for a little bit. So we're going to do the same thing this morning. Verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, how could you read on and just not stop for a second and think, this is Jesus in the same room with his disciples who he's known, who he loves. John even calls himself the one Jesus loves. And Jesus is still saying, guys, if you love me, you're going to do these things. Not out of fear you will do these things. Not out of uh, a desire to do good works you will do these things. Not because I saved you. You're going to do these things. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do these things. And he gives it an if statement because it's a decision, right? Jesus isn't forcing this upon anybody. He's telling the disciples, if you'd love me, if you decide that all this has been worth it, these years of ministry, of of not having a place to lay our head, of, of walking all over the country, ministering to people, If I, Jesus is saying, if I'm worth it, if you love me, you will keep my commands. That's a huge statement from Jesus to these guys who are probably thinking, of course we love you, Jesus. Have we not shown it? Have we not followed you? Have we not done all the things that you've said? Jesus doesn't really care what they're thinking because he prefaces it with, if you love me. If you love me, you will keep my commands. So before he goes to the cross, before he promises a helper, before he promises the Holy Spirit will come, he says, if you will love me, you'll keep my commands. So that begs the question, actually two questions this morning, before we even get out of chapter, verse 1. First question that we have to ask ourselves as followers of Christ, do I love Jesus? Do I really love? Love Jesus, or do I just say, what's the old song, Jesus is just all right with me? Or do I love Jesus because he saved me? Do I love it because he is my savior? Do I love the thing that he did for me, or do I really love him? Because Jesus makes it very clear, if you love me, meaning that you should love me as Christ followers, not me, but Jesus is saying, If you love me, you will keep my commands. So that's the first question that we should ask ourselves is, do I really love Jesus or do I love salvation? Because they're two of the same thing. You can't have one without the other. But do I love this because of what Jesus did or do I love Jesus? Because if I do, Jesus himself said, you will keep my commands. So that's the second question. First of all, do I love Jesus? Secondly, do I keep his commands? Now, what are those commands? There's a lot of them. If we go back over the last, you know, three years of Jesus' ministry, even these last 14 chapters of John, but just think about where they are, right? So they've been in this room. They've had the meal. They've done these things. Jesus has been teaching. He's been washing feet. Since this dinner conversation has transpired and the washing of the feet, here are three of the things that Jesus has commanded just in this setting that they are at the Passover meal. One thing that he said is after he washed the feet, Jesus says, you ought to wash one another's feet. That's one command. So Jesus is saying, if you love me, you'll do these things, disciples. You will wash each other's feet. You will serve one another. You will bear one another's burdens. You will confess to one another. That's what washing the feet, you know, you're bringing it back to the Lord for confession. You will do these things. That's one command that he gave in this room. Another one he gave in John 13, 34, Jesus tells his disciples, just as I have loved you, love one another. That's a command. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do this. Not only will you do it, but you will do it the way that I did it, the way that I loved you. These are not suggestions. These are commands from Jesus. When he asked the disciples, if you love me, you'll do these things. Here's the third one that Jesus said during this night of dinner and conversation. Jesus tells his disciples, believe in God and believe in me. That's a command. Believe in God, believe in me. 
Jesus gave these three important commands just at this dinner in these conversations leading up to the cross. These are important, right? How could we as a church, as people who profess and confess to be followers of Jesus Christ, not take these words seriously? If we say, I love Jesus, I know Jesus, well, Jesus says if you do, wash feet, love the way that I love, and believe in God and believe in me. We have to live it out. And that goes in part of the greater things. We can't do greater things if we don't do these things. Jesus is saying, go, live these out. Words of Christ in red, make it happen. Go ye, therefore, and do these things. Keep my commands. All right, that's verse 1. Actually, verse 15, but the first verse. <laughs> Come on. Verse 16 it says this. This is Jesus again. If you love me, you'll follow my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. So these are two great pictures here of this relationship dynamic between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that's going on here. Jesus, who we've read about in all of John's gospel, has all the resources of heaven available to him. Amen? He has said, the Father has given all to me. I have it at my disposal because I am the Son of God. I have everything I need. Me and the Father are one. He, he, but even in that, having all those things, he still lovingly submits to the Father. right? And in this, he is saying, I could give it to you because I have all the things that the Father has, but out of my submission to the Father, I am going to ask him. But because I know that it's according to his will, he's going to send it, right? Just like we were, talked about, Daniel talked about last week. If I ask it, and if it's selfish gain or motivation, God's going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. But if we do it in accordance to his will to advance the kingdom of God, he's going to say, here it is, and here's even more than you asked for. And so this is Jesus saying, I'm going to ask the Father because he's the Father and I submit to the Father out of his love for me and because what I'm asking for is going to further the kingdom, he's going to give it to me. And what he's going to send is another counselor to be with you for how long? Forever. Amen. Forever. So this is a, you see just in this one verse, the dynamics of this trinity, right? And Daniel talked about that too last week. It's nowhere you're going to find that word in the Bible. But we see it right here in context when we read and we ask that Holy Spirit for understanding. He's going to show us that understanding, that relationship. So don't be that guy or that girl or that person and say, well, that word's not in there, so I don't believe in it. Dinosaurs weren't in the Bible either, but they were there, right? Don't be that person to say it's not there. Do some digging. Do some research. Do some context. Ask the counselor for understanding, and he'll give us understanding. He will give it to you. What a great picture that is of this, how it works between the Father, who is the headship, the Son, who is in submission to the Father and the Holy Spirit, but all working together for our good. So, another counselor to be with you forever. Who is Jesus talking about here as this other counselor? Holy Spirit, that's right. Holy Spirit, some Bibles say comforter, some say an advocate. Um, the Greek word is parakletos, which means advocate, someone to stand in my stead, to go with me, to be a helper, um, to, to be that person. The Holy Spirit, in this verse, Jesus is just giving the disciples an overview of what's going to happen. He doesn't say, buckle in, grab some water, because we're going to dive deep into the theology of the Holy Spirit here, disciples. He just tells them he's coming and then I'm going to send him and he's going to be your helper. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your advocate. And he is part of the God head, part of the Trinity. He is going to live with us for how long again? Forever. Not for a time. Not for when you're really digging into your Bible and praying a lot. He is constantly with us forever he doesn't depart he doesn't take christmas break off 
He is with us forever. He won't leave and come back. He doesn't take vacation. He is an ever-present help in our time of need. He is a constant teacher. The Holy Spirit is to give us understanding, wisdom, discernment, and conviction. Amen? So who is this counselor? The Holy Spirit. Verse 17, Jesus gives us a little bit more of an overview, a little bit more of an introduction. Verse 17, he is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So why don't this is this is important for us when we try to hold the world to a different standard. We try to hold the world to a biblical standard or a Christian standard. They don't know it. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't see him. They don't know him. They don't recognize him. They don't have him convicting them, giving them understanding. Giving them so when we see the world acting like the world and we go, boy, those guys sure are sinners. Yeah. So were we once when we were absent from the Holy Spirit and we still sin. But we have a Holy Spirit to say, you, sh- you probably shouldn't do that. Or after we have done it, say, you had better repent, brother. That's what he does. He teaches us. He convicts us. He's our counsel, our comforter. And Jesus says that not only is he going to be with us for how long? Forever. But he's not only going to be with us, but he's going to be in us, residing within us. When Jesus says that promised Holy Spirit is going to come, and if we continue reading the word, we see he's going to come, right? And he fills us up, and the world gets set on fire after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and Peter, like Daniel said, goes from timid, denying Jesus, to on fire, preaching like a son of a gun, and seeing lives changed because of that promised Holy Spirit who wasn't just with him, but who was in him. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. If we are alive in Christ, we are no longer slaves. We have asked for Jesus to be our Lord and Master, surrendered our lives to him. That promised Holy Spirit immediately comes to dwell in us and live in us. Not, here's your checklist. You've asked Jesus. Now, once you knock these things out, then the Holy Spirit will come. No, he immediately indwells in us and starts to do those jobs of convicting of counseling, of teaching, of giving us wisdom. That little voice that corrects you when you want to curse somebody out. That's the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that. Or you give out those different words like, you know, son of a biscuit eating bulldog or whatever it is instead of the words you really just want to say. That could be the Holy Spirit too, softening our hearts, right? And when you get that voice saying, I I don't, you don't want to act on that sin again. You don't want to do that again. That's the Holy Spirit working in us, alive in us, giving us understanding of God's word, convicting us of our sin. But the world doesn't know him and can't. Why? Because the helper or the counselor is only for believers. Only for believers. That's why when you try to debate somebody who doesn't know God or try to talk to somebody about his word or an atheist or somebody says, I've read the Bible. And I still don't believe, because you read it apart from the Holy Spirit. It's just a book if you don't know God. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you to give you understanding and discernment, it's just a book. But once he lives in us, and he's teaching us and showing us, you see that and you read these things, and those Jesus light bulbs just start popping up, going, bing. Oh, I get it now. I understand it now. Because the Holy Spirit's working in us and teaching us, counseling us, showing us things. That we wouldn't get. Now, God can use a Bible to draw an unbeliever to him. I'm not saying he can't because the Holy Spirit can work in that way too. But when somebody's adamantly against God and an enemy of God says this Bible doesn't make any sense, that's why. Because they don't know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't give them understanding. But if you are sitting alone in a jail cell somewhere and you never heard the gospel and somebody gives you a Bible and you pick it up and you read it, The Holy Spirit can absolutely use that to draw you to him. But apart from his Holy Spirit, we're not going to get understanding. 
It's at that point where we lay it down and release it and give it to God and surrender and ask for the Holy Spirit. And man, we're going to get all sorts of revelation from his word, truths from his word. Why? Because he's the spirit of truth. He can't mislead us. He can't give us wrong teaching. Now, we'll see stuff from other places where people are claiming to be in the Holy Spirit and giving out false teaching after false teaching. What does that tell you? They don't have the Holy Spirit. Because if it was the Holy Spirit, this spirit of truth, who is a teacher, a comforter, an advocate, and a helper, is not going to lead you down incorrect teaching. He's going to give us sound truth because he is the spirit of truth. And we will be able to stand in it and believe it. When someone claims to have the Holy Spirit and they spout off a bunch of nonsense, they're believing in themselves, trying to have some other selfish gain from that. Now, I'm not going to go on to a full-on sermon of the working of the Holy Spirit because they're going, again, over this conversation Jesus is having with his disciples. But the whole study of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology, if you want to look it up and dive deeper into it. In theology circles, yeah, it's called pneumatology, which means study of the spirit. And we get pneuma from the Greek word that means it's like a strong wind or a wind you can't see. And that's where they get the word for spirit, the Holy Spirit. So like if you have a pneumatic tools, that, that powerful air, we get the word pneumatic from. When you put that hose on that air gun and, vroom, vroom, and it just feels like, oh, yeah, rah, rah, rah. you get that powerful that stuff in your hand. That's the Holy Spirit, man. That's pneumatology. It's a strong power that we can't see is the Holy Spirit. God can give us understanding, and there's a lot of unbiblical stuff out there concerning the Holy Spirit. Some of those things you won't find anywhere. So you ever notice a lot of those false teachers don't ever teach the Bible? There's a reason for that. Um, because if it's not in the Bible, the Holy Spirit's not going to give us teaching and understanding about it. Um, and if it's not in Scripture, it's dangerous teaching. Um, why do we know that? Well, Jesus just told us if we obey his commands, right? Not if we obey somebody telling us that they have the Holy Spirit and let me tell you how you can. Jesus said, no, if you obey my commands, we're in his word, ask the Holy Spirit for understanding. Um, we can't just throw out scripture after Pentecost and rely on the Holy Spirit because that would be a contradiction of what Jesus told us to stand firm on his word and obey his commands. Don't get me started. That's another sermon. Let's go to verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself in him, to him. There's so much beauty in Jesus' words here. First off, we know the disciples knew he was leaving. Peter has asked to go with him, and Jesus said, no, not right now. Uh, Thomas says, how will we find the way to you? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and now he's promising them that, that even though he is leaving and they can't come with him, he will not leave them alone as orphans. That's such a beautiful picture of the care and the loving nature of Christ to say, I'm not going to leave you guys alone. I'm not going to leave you sur stranded here as orphans in this world. He reassures them that even though the world won't see him, his followers will. And because he lives we will live too. If, there's that if word again, they are in the Father and keeps his commands. If they love him, they will be loved by the Father as well. What a joy that is. We just sang that song, I am a child of God. Jesus spells it out right here. If you know the Father, the Father knows you, you can be a child of God. We are, if you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are adopted into that tree branch that, uh, of, of, that goes back generations and generations. You are adopted sons and daughters and children of God. If you love me and follow my commands, Jesus says. There's always a preface. And people say, well, Jesus is the only real example we have of 
of, of true love, of just a love that gives no matter what it receives. That's true if we believe, right? There is a condition. The condition is faith, that we put our faith and trust in him, and then we'll receive his unconditional love. You say, but isn't that a condition? Kind of. The condition is believing in him and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Then we have received that unconditional love. But what a joy it is to know that, that God the Father, creator of all things, knows me because of Jesus. What a blessed assurance that is. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Beautiful words that were written a long time ago. If you know that song, or maybe you know the third verse, the third verse of that song, Blessed Assurance, is perfect submission. All is at rest. What does submission mean? Following his command. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. What a joy that is. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Lost in his what? His love. That reciprocal love. If we love him, he loves, man, it's a beautiful relationship. And it has to be a relationship. That's where it goes back to that first verse. If you love me. Jesus is not a get out of jail free card. It's a relationship. He wants to know us intimately. He wants us to take our stuff to him, to give him our, our heart, to give him our issues, to give him our, our trust. It's a relationship. He wants to know us. He wants us to say, yes, I love you, Jesus. That might be hard for some of us. How hard is it, guys, some of us, to say, yeah, I love you to another guy? I the first time I said it to, to told my dad, I love you, I was kind of like, what well, this feels weird. We shouldn't, right? God put that on our heart. He wrote love on our heart to show, we, show us that we can show love. And if we can't show love first and foremost to Christ, we've got some stuff to work through, right? He will not leave us as orphans. He promised his disciples he would not leave them alone. And guess what, church? If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, he will not leave you as an orphan either. You are not alone. You are not forgotten. You are not in a battle alone. You have the promised Holy Spirit. You have Jesus. You have God the Father. You have one another as brothers and sisters to walk in this battle alone. We are not alone. We are not orphans. There's a song about that that we'll have to sing one of these days. I'm not orphans. I'm an orphan, not an orphan. I don't remember how it goes. It's been a while. Anyway, verse 22. I'm doing my best to get through this rest of this chapter, so we'll, we'll make it happen. Judas, verse 22, not Iscariot. John makes a point to say, not that guy. We already got rid of that one. <laughs> Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Jesus is repeating himself again to make it clear to these guys. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. He'll, he'll keep my commands. My father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Did you get that? My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus still talking about the three in one. Verse 24, the one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. Jesus is constantly relaying that message. I'm not talking of my own words. The Father sent me in full authority. I have all his power. He gave me the word. He gave me to you guys. This is from the Father. Verse 25, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. That's beautiful. He will teach and he will remind. It's another job of the Holy Spirit. According to Jesus, two of his attributes are to teach. Amen. We need teaching. And to remind, because we need reminding. 
How many of us have ever wanted to share something with somebody and immediately had a panic attack? You're like, how am I going to remember what to say? How am I going to remember which verses to share? How am I going to know how to talk to this person about the gospel? Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's got you. He's going to teach and remind you. And you're going to probably say things that you afterwards you're going to be like, whoa, did I say that? How did I remember that verse? How did I remember this testimony? Because the Holy Spirit is going to teach and remind. How do you think these gospel writers, let me give you a couple of numbers here. So the gospel of Matthew was written before 70 AD and as early as 50 AD. So somewhere between 17 and 37 years after the cross. Gospel of Mark is said to be the earliest gospel. Besides Matthew, there's some debate which one was first with an authorship between 55 AD to 70 AD. Again, 22 to 37 years after Christ's death. Um, Luke was not, was written before AD 62, so there's 30 years or so after the cross. And the last of the gospels appears to have been written uh, which would have been John uh, in the 80s or 90s AD. So we're talking decades after the cross before these gospel accounts were written. How do you think these gospel authors, aside from the Holy Spirit, would have been able to do that? They wouldn't have been. But because of the Holy Spirit who was sent, who indwelled within them, reminded and taught them the things that they had seen. Jesus even said, you won't get this now, but later you'll understand it to his disciples. How could he say that? Because he knew the helper was going to come. He was going to bring these things back to mind that Jesus had taught them years before where they were like, oh, I don't get it, Jesus. To where now, after he's dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended, Holy Spirit comes, fills them, and now they're like, oh, man, I get it now. Now I understand it. Now the Holy Spirit has taught and reminded me. And now I can sit and put pen to paper or tell Luke to write these things down for me because I can remember all these things. And then you look at the four Gospels together in the synoptics with the one eye and say, wow, there's so many parallels. There's so many things that are true. These couldn't be made up. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit on these Gospel writers that they could do this. And, and bring these things back to mind because of what Jesus promised them when he would send his Holy Spirit. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You have heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let's leave this place. That's the last verse I may have left off there. So Jesus is saying, I've dropped all this stuff on you guys. I'm telling you the Holy Spirit's coming. I will not leave you as orphans. And he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus is giving them, I am leaving my peace with you guys. I do not give you as the world gives. I mean, the world gives and maybe they want something in return or maybe they only give a little bit. Jesus says, I'm giving you supernatural peace. This surpasses all understanding. And I'm going to give it to you so your heart won't be troubled or fearful. Disciples who I'm about to leave. And he says, I'm leaving. I'm going to the Father. You should be happy for me. You shouldn't be sad. I'm going to the Father who is greater than I. And I'm telling you now so that way when it happens, you'll, you'll understand. You'll believe. I wonder if that was written just specific for Thomas. Uh, it'll happen. If it does happen, you may be believe. I'm sure Thomas wasn't the only doubter. I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming. The ruler of the world is coming. Who is the ruler of the world? The enemy, Satan. But Jesus says, guess what, guys? He has no power over me. He says, on the contrary, that the world may know that I love the Father, I'm going to do what the Father's commanded me. The enemy has no power over me, Jesus is saying. I could squash his head if I wanted to. 
But because the Father has commanded me to go and do this, to go to the cross and die for the whole sin, the, the sin of all mankind, I'm going to do that instead. But the enemy has no power over me, Jesus says. So that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Jesus again starts off with verse 17, I think it was, when he says, I'm asking the Father and he's going to send. He starts off this passage in submission to the Father, but showing how this relationship works. And then he ends this chapter with the same heart of submission to the Father. But saying, I love the Father, so I do as he commanded me. God told and sent his only begotten son. And Jesus said, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Father, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I love you. And I'm going to serve and I'm going to do and I'm going to live it out just the way that you've commanded me. And the world's going to know it, that I love the Father because I'm going to willingly go to the cross. What a beautiful picture. I don't know how many times I can say that same phrasing over and over, but when you read it and you're asking God to show you something, church, I probably read John chapter 14, I don't know, a couple dozen times maybe. But as we go through this book of John study, and God is showing himself over and over, new things, new understanding, new teaching, new remembrance of things that I probably had forgotten. So if you've read this Bible cover to cover 30 times, keep reading it. Keep asking the Holy Spirit for understanding. Keep asking him to teach us, to show us, to give us discernment. Because he's faithful to do it, he will. And also to know that we'll never know it all till we get to heaven. And even then, we're going to be like, praise the Lord, I'm in heaven, hallelujah. I don't need to know all the things that I got caught up on on earth that I was like, I don't understand. Ask the Holy Spirit, he'll give us understanding. It might take five or six years. It may not be immediate, but if we keep asking, we keep trusting that one day that Holy Spirit light bulb will go off and you'll say, ah, now I get it. But Jesus says what? If you love him, keep his commands. Keep his commands. Where do we find his commands? In here. Hide his word in our heart so that we may not sin against God. If we don't hide the word in our heart, we'll be out there just, how does James put it, tossed about like waves in the ocean. We have to have something firm to stand on. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we could gather together and celebrate what you're doing in this church, but also, God, that your spirit can teach us and show us, give us understanding of things we might not quite understand or things we might not quite get. God, but in your faithfulness, you've promised that a helper will help us, that our comforter will comfort, that our counselor will counsel. God, if we only ask, if we ask it in faith, and we ask it in trust that you will do it, Lord, you're faithful to respond. You're faithful to teach. So God, we just uh, come to you this morning thanking you for the words, God, and help us as we ask ourselves truthfully those questions. Do I love you? Jesus, number one, and number two, do I follow your commands? Help us to wrestle with that this week, God. Help our hearts to, to align with your word, to align with your spirit, and uh, to continue to do greater things, as we heard last week as well. Thank you for your word, Father. We give you praise. All glory and honor belong to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this last song, church, and as we're singing, man, if you're wrestling with something or the Holy Spirit is changing your heart, convicting you, and you want to pray this morning, you can come pray. Daniel's up front. Pastor Scott's over here. I'll pray with you. Dave, any of us will gladly play, pray with you. Um, but that question, do I love Jesus? Man, if your question is this morning, I'm not sure, ask him, Lord, help me. Help my unbelief. Help me understand this relationship. Help me to fall more in love with you. And he is faithful to do it. Let's sing. Just one thing real quick. I kept mulling this over as Roy was preaching, and the more he was preaching, uh, the more I was like, these things are kind of piecing together like puzzles. So 
we read as a family at home. And last night, it was my turn to read in First John. And so when Roy's talking about orphans and children and, and, you know, if you love me, obey me and keep my commandments. There's one thing I wanted to read to you. It's talking about God's children. This is First John, uh, the end of chapter 2, going into chapter 3. He says, so now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him and his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And a little bit later, it says, everyone who commits sin also breaks the law. Sin is the breaking of law. You know that he was revealed so that he might take sins away. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the verse that was, again, those light bulb moments. Now, according to this in the scripture, and that's God's word, there's two categories. It was either A or B. And we're going to read real quick about what these two categories are. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. Verse 10 says, this is how God's children and the devil's children are made evident. So do you see that? You're either God's child or you're the devil's child. You're of the world or you're not of the world. And I just wanted to leave that as something to, to think about. Because, whoa, when we read that, I was like, oh, my. It's like there's literally two categories. You're either God's child or you're the devil's child. And I don't know, but that second one kind of creeps me out a little bit. But that was me. I was of the world. I didn't belong to God. And even though God loves me, his merciful love towards me that he didn't just, you know, kill me right where I stood, he's just and he's merciful and he, even though I was very stubborn and slow coming to the Lord, he was merciful and his love showed that. So, yes, he loved me. But you're either one or the other. And that's, that's a big deal. hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream from the well? Jesus is calling.
church, don't leave here today thinking that or asking that if, if in fact, I'm a child of God. If you're not sure, let's talk about it. Let's hang around. If you have any doubt whatsoever, we'd love to talk with you this morning. Um, that being said, tonight at 530, be back here for potluck. Uh, there will be food. So, I mean, what, there's no football on today, right, Ben? So there's no excuses, huh? No excuses. No excuses. Amen. Well, thank you, church. It's been our pleasure to worship with you this morning. Um, such a good time. Charlie Gibbons, will you pray for us, brother?